As you can see, God is doing an amazing work in Japan, especially for our team. We appreciate the report. If you have your Bibles, I'd love for you to turn to the book of James. And if you recall, over the last couple of weeks, we've kind of plunged right in to a book that is targeting what we would say Christians who have been converted from Judaism. And we're talking about the first, probably the first piece of literature in the New Testament. And he's targeting those Jews who are now suffering persecution, and as we see in verse 2, trials. And yet, in the middle of that trials, we see that it, the title of this morning's message is The God Behind the Trials. And a lot of times when the trials emerge, um, there's a temptation, at least, to question some things about God. Let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, we have many of our people, in fact, about three or four that I've prayed with over the last two services, of people who are going through job changes, transitions, when they're being retrenched, they're going back to their country of origin, or their department is being shut down, or the, assert, the future is uncertain and unknown, and everything's kind of up in the air right now. And a lot of times as Christians, it's easy to grow and, and lean toward a temptation of, of, can God really provide for us? Is, is that, it, it does not, he, it, doesn't he care for us? Will he not provide for us? And yet we see the jobs leave or we see the uncertainty there. And so it's, it's easy for us to question God's provision. When, when we hear of a death of a loved one, and we've had about three or four this past week, where we've had members who've had family members die and now they're in different parts of the world, um, taking care of family manners, and we had one this week as well. And, and you're thinking while they were sick, could not God have the power to raise them up? When, when you get the report and the prognosis, does not God have the power to, to, to bring about a healing? And yet it seems like the situation is actually deteriorating. And so the, the question and the temptation comes up, is God powerful enough to combat these diseases? Then, maybe on a different level, as is, is we see the, the challenge, um, especially when we see injustice done, when we see the, the 1,200 who lost their lives in Nepal and northern India with the flood, we see the bombing in the London tube um, this past two days. We see all of these things, and you're going, where is the justice of that? That's unfair. Why did God allow that to happen to what we would call and deem innocent people? And so you begin to question uh, again, God's goodness and God's justice, maybe on a more personal level, when you see your spouse turn away from the vows, when you see them want to check out of the marriage, when you see, um, when you see your, your kids go off in rebellion, when you see things begin to crumble in their school and all their aspirations, and you wonder if God loves you. And so there's a temptation for us to question God's love. All of these begin to converge well, in the first century, there is a challenge, and we're going to see in James chapter 1, to question God in his character. So let's pick up in James chapter 1, verse 12. Um, we get a little momentum there. We close this last week with this verse. It says, blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. This says, once he's been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. So that's an encouraging word when it comes to trial, right? So whenever the adversity comes, when the adver um, trials come, when the hardships come, the pain, the loss, the suffering, the betrayal, all of those things, God says, if you persevere, if you stay under that, God will bless you because of that. Well, in verse 13, there seems to be hardship, but a different response. Instead of praising God, as we wrote something just a moment ago as our youth choir led us, to let our, raise our hands in praise, we actually raise our fists. We begin to, to point the blame at God. And so look what it says in verse 13. It says, let no one of you say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. So there seems to be this, this element, and, and so we're going to, let me paint a basic truth. God does not tempt you. Basic truth from God's word. God does not tempt you. But verse 13 actually is a real life situation where I think now James has his ears, his audio tuned in to the church, and it looks like there are people who are questioning God. 
But he says, let not this even come out of your mouth. It should be no assertion, no claim that, uh, that, that God would be the source of temptation. And so a lot of times when we're in trouble, we blame God. And so we, we say God is the one who's caused this. But the word of God tells us you cannot, cannot say God tempts us. In fact, when you say I'm tempted by God, there's a distorted view of God. Uh, remember it says in James 1, it says those who doubt, that they become like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. And the verse 8 is double-minded man, which is unstable in all of your ways. And so when somebody begins to doubt, you begin to get confused about who God is. You begin to question his goodness, his love, his mercy, his justice, his kindness, all of these things. But we have to make a distinction because a lot of times when we think of temptation and trial, so what has happened, verse 12, introduces the trial. Obviously, the purpose is very clear. Hardship, adversity, pain is there to strengthen your faith. It is to grow you in your walk with God. It is to, to teach you how to depend upon God. It, it's a venue to show God's mercy and his goodness. But on the other hand, verse 13, it goes from trial to temptation. Remember, we've been talking about this the last couple of weeks, that in the original text, the word is the same. It, whether it's trial or temptation, the, the original word is the same. It depends on the context of whether or not you're going to translate it trial or whether you'll translate it temptation. And so now the people are saying, okay, there's a trial. God gave me the trial. I got that. But now this trial has led to a temptation. And now they're making a claim that God has now tempted you. And that tempt that temptation will lead to evil, thus God is evil. But God's word tells us in the Old Testament, so let's go back to the Old Testament a little bit. Remember, these are Jews, so they'll understand a little bit of the Old Testament, that God uses the word test in the Old Testament. Genesis chapter 22, will you remember that passage when, it, it, when he's, he's talking to Abraham, Isaac has been born, but Genesis chapter 22 verse 1 says, God tests Abraham. And this is how he does it. Go sacrifice your son. So here's an amazing work, right? It says God is actually the source of testing, of trials, of adversity. Later on in Deuteronomy chapter 8, when the people are in the wilderness, this is what God's word says, that he's going to test Israel to see what is in their heart. So make no doubt about this, no confusion. God does test. God does send trials. He does send hardship, adversity. He allows those to come into the believer's heart. But there's a radical difference between trials, which strengthen your faith, which test you, which uh, test your heart to grow you, and temptation. Temptation is there to incite you, to induce you to sin, to, to undermine your faith. Two totally different purposes that end up in two totally different destinations. But is it not in human nature do we have a propensity to blame other people when we sin? How many of you have children that blame siblings? You know, or your wife or your husband, and you're saying, it's always somebody else's fault. And when you go into the business workplace, how many times the boss gets blamed, the company gets blamed, the employees get blamed, the customers get blamed. When you go into school, it's the principal, it's the structure, it's the teacher, it's the students. We go through on and on and on. It's, so, it's our propensity, right? If you go back to the first sin, Adam, remember when God found him in the garden where he was hiding behind um, the church pew? I mean, I'm sorry, the, the, the tree in the garden? And he was trying to hide there, and God found him. And he says, what have you done, remember? And, he's, and this is what Adam said, first words that came out of his mouth. Anybody remember? Come on, man, help me out here. The woman! How did that even come out of our mouth, guys? That's not even possible. You blame your wife on your sin? I'm just practicing from Adam. I'm being very biblical, right? But see, Adam says, not only, and he stretches across the line even further. Look what he says. He says, the woman that you gave me. Did he just blame God for his sin? How many times have we said that, right? And then what does Eve say? Well, Adam's kind of in the clear now, so the attention is to Eve. What does Eve say? Women, what does Eve say? Servant! We just immediately point, right? How quick we are. Now, I, I don't know how many of you have multiple children. Raise your hand if you have multiple children. If you don't know, let me know. We can talk afterwards. But if you have multiple children, how many of you have ever seen multiple children, whenever something goes wrong, what happens, right? 
It's quite amazing. When we had our first child, and many of you may have this pattern, the first child lulls you in, thinking that every child will be well-behaved. Right, That first child, and you're thinking, okay, I'm going to go for the second one. And our second one, our first one was well-behaved. Our second one was not. If we would have had our second one, there may have not been two or three. And he was just bad all the time. But every time he got in trouble, 95% of the time, he would call his brother's name, which is Austin. And he said, this is his favorite word for years and years. Austin did it. So it didn't matter what happened. He just constantly pointed. We have that propensity, do we not, that 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 of giftedness to point. In fact, one of the men in my former churches said this, Pastor, if God would not have made women so beautiful, I would not lust. <laughs> You're going to blame God for that, right? How quick we are to point at everybody else. There's a group of college students that played a trick on one of their um, classmates, and he had fallen asleep. And you may not know the, the name of this cheese or the smell of it. It's called Lindberger cheese. And it is the nastiest smelling cheese you've ever smelt in your entire life. It is actually, it will not be in heaven. Trust me. All right. It is very, very bad smelling. But they had put a little thin strip of that cheese right on his top lip while he's sleeping. And so he wakes up to this putrid smell. And he wakes up and and he's in his dorm room. He says, man, this dorm room stinks. And so he runs out into the hall to get like a fresh breath of air. And he runs out into the hall. He says, this hall stinks. Then he runs out of the dorm to maybe get a breath of fresh air on the outside. And he says, this whole world stinks. Never knowing that he's the one that is the source of the stink. (laughs) How many times do we point at everyone else but ourselves? God's word says, Do not say, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, pointing the finger. So quick for us to point at our boss, our employer, our spouse, our family member, our circumstances, the economy, the government, on and on and on for the wrongs that we've done. And God is saying, we need to take responsibility, but understand this clearly, God cannot tempt. And then he gives you two reasons in verse 13 why he cannot tempt. He says, he cannot be tempted by evil, which means it targets his character, or what I would say, his holiness. And second, he cannot, in his activity, he says he does not, himself does not tempt anyone. So it's his character as well as his activity. It's impossible for God to tempt. So let's go back to the, um, the character, his holiness. It says, he himself cannot be tempted. So that means it's impossible you, you cannot get, I'm going to, I don't know if it's a word in the Webster Dictionary, but I would say this, God is untemptable. He cannot be wooed. He cannot be swayed. He cannot be enticed. It goes against his character. So I'm going to, I think sometimes we forget how holiness and sin cannot coexist. So maybe to give you a picture of this, many of you remember that Paul says that uh, Jesus He says, he who knew no sin became sin on our behalf. And so John's gospel says that, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So we have Jesus on the cross. And I want you to catch the scene. He's hanging on the cross. And God says he has placed all sin of all humanity on him. So we can't even imagine what that is. Add up all of your sins that you've ever will commit, ever have committed, throw it on him, multiply it by every single person who's ever lived and will live, and they land on Jesus Christ. So that's all that sin is on him. The fourth statement coming from the mouth of Jesus on the cross when he cries these words, and I think you get a sense that God is untemptable. Holiness and sin cannot coexist. When he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God and his holiness cannot coexist. They cannot converge. They cannot collaborate with sin. Impossible. It's his character. Second, it's his activity. He says he himself does not tempt anyone. So it, it, he doesn't do anything to, to entice us, to move us. He's incapable of that. It's a moral impossibility for God to tempt you. So even though you may cl- make the claim, God caused this, God did this, God was the root of this, it tells us not only in his character, but in his activity. In fact, it's the other way. God not only doesn't tempt you, he provides everything you need to combat temptation. 
In 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13, many of you are familiar with the verse that says, no temptation is overtaking you, but it's common to man. God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. And with the temptation, also provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. So God has given you everything you need. In this book, James chapter 4, later on, it says this, submit to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee. Even in the Lord's Prayer, he says, lead us not into what? I'm telling you, God's character, his activity, it is impossible not only for him to be tempted, but for him to tempt you as well. Well, that begs the question, does it not? Because all of us experience temptation. So if not God, who? Verse 14 answers that. Verse 14 says this. When one is tempted, one is carried away and enticed by his own lust. So what's the source of temptation? Well, if it's not God, we can call God into question. And James not only answers that concisely, he answers it clearly. God does not tempt, he cannot tempt, and he cannot be tempted. So who's the source? Anybody have any idea according to the word of God? Who's the source? Us. This is quite enlightening, isn't it? You mean to tell me that all my sins that I commit, that I'm actually the source, the root of the issue? Absolutely. Let's see what the Word of God says. He says that, that it is our cravings, it's our lust, it's our desires, it's our yearnings, it's our wants. It's, it's that we have to have it or we need to say that or we have to grab that or we gravitate toward that. I love what Martin Luther says about lust and passions and, and sinful desires. He says these lustful passions are curved in on ourself. Many times we start looking at what other people have done to me, but that's not the greatest danger of what has been done to you. It's what's been done by you. God is calling us again to remember that this root of the problem is our sinful desires, our passions. And so here it comes. So he's going to say, when you're tempted, and he's going to use two words, and I think it might give us a clear picture of how sin operates. So first one, it says, he's carried away. Now, in the English, that doesn't really give us, we, we carry um, groceries or we can carry a, a briefcase or luggage, but this word carried away is a little different. It means to be forcefully and violently drug down a path. So in our mind, a lot of times we think sin is this, that we're an unguided believer, we're naive, we're innocent, and all of a sudden this enemy comes, Satan, and he picks us up and drags us down this road of sin. Absolutely not. According to the word of God, it's our desires. And that desire actually picks us up, drags us down the road in this path of sin. In addition to that, it says not only are we carried away, we are enticed. That word enticed means that there's been a a bait. It means that there's been an enticement, an inducement in order for you to grab the bait and bite the bait. And that biting of the bait will bring you not only danger, but destruction as well. So let me kind of give you a picture of how this works. What happens when that, igni- that, that igniting of the desire begins to, to, to rise up inside of you? What happens is now your anticipation of the pleasure, your anticipation of the relief, your anticipation of, of that sin, that enjoyment begins to consume you and all of a sudden, and, and your focus is there and then your focus is not on the very thing that could bring you safety and provide relief. We're so geared up. Many of us say, well, pastor, I've worked real hard. I deserve this. I'm going to go get drunk because it's so much stress. I'm going to go get this, or I'm going to do this. Or or, or sometimes you say, man, if I can just say this word out of anger, it will make me feel so good. And you think, and this is what, and so you're driven to this. And God says that it starts with this enticement. It starts, you bite the bait. You begin to anticipate this pleasure or this outcome or how good it will feel when you complete the sin and this desire. And God says, actually, you've been distracted and you've taken your heart and your mind away from the very things that would bring you safety, the word of God, the presence of Christ, the love of God. When you're sinning, the very last thing you see probably is the love of God. You're so consumed, you're so involved, you're so enraptured, you're so enveloped with what that sin and how good that will feel that you forget all these other things. 
But it all starts with a simple desire, does it not? That's where God's word says. And so the source is within ourselves. I think maybe to give you a little picture, there's this little boy who was told by his dad, son, do not go swim in the canal. Very clear, concise, clear. He says, do you understand? Yes, sir. Later on that evening, he comes in, the little boy. He's in a soaking wet bathing suit. And so the father says to him, where have you been? And the son leases on us. He says, son, dad, I've been swimming in the canal. The dad says, did I not tell you? Do not swim in the canal. And the son said, yes, dad, you told me. The dad says, well, why did you do that? And this was his response. He says, well, dad, I had my swimsuit with me and I could not resist the temptation. And then the dad says, why did you bring your swimsuit with you to the canal? And he said, so I would be prepared in case I was tempted. <laughs> Is that not who we are? You always leave that little opening, that little caveat, just in case there's an opening. Let me give you an example. You go to the computer screen and you're just looking and all of a sudden there's that little link and you click. You're in a conversation and everything is godly. Then a word of gossip comes and it's just that little gossip that begins to leak out another way. You're standing in a, in a line, in a queue, and all of a sudden somebody cuts the queue. And all of a sudden something begins to rise up inside of you. And you, you leave that little opening. God says, when we have unexercised minds, when we have idle hands, when we have an uncommitted heart, we become vulnerable. When we fill our hearts with the mind of God and we fill it with the love of God and we put it, the word of God inside of you, then God says those walls and those protection will be able to protect you from those desires. So verse 15 kind of gives us a little bit more insight in what I would call the path of sin. And it starts really at the beginning, goes to the end. It goes from the start to the finish. It says this is what happened. And when lust has conceived, it gives birth to what? Sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth what? So you have three spots, right? You have the beginning and the end. You have the start. You have the finish. It begins with a lust, with desire, with yearnings, with craving. And then it gives birth. It conceives. And many of you are moms, so you understand the process very well. Very vivid imagery, is it not? It's conceived, and it gives birth to sin. And then ultimately it ends and concludes in death. So let's start very simply here. It starts with lust or begins with a desire. Now look what it says, when lust has conceived. It's not a plural form, so it's just simple observation, but I think it's insightful. It doesn't say that you have a hundred lust. It doesn't say that there's a multitude of, of cravings, just one. Because I think many times we justify as believers, do we not? That, oh, we're so good in this area, pastor, in this area, and we're righteous in this area. We got this area covered. God, Satan doesn't need all those areas, just one. One desire. David looked at Bathsheba, one desire. He was a godly king, but he had that one crack, one opening, and it took him. Just that one desire that can create havoc for you. It begins with one lust, one craving that demands action. That's what temptation is. It's a junction. It's an intersection. It's a crossroads. And when you hit that crossroads, one or two things have to happen. Either you deny, denounce that craving, put to death those desires and those passions, or you feed it. You act on it. You move on it. Everyone here will have those temptations. No one is immune. And when those temptations come and that junction comes, we have a choice. Are we going to deny it? We're going to denounce it? We're going to renounce it? We're going to put it to death? Or are we going to act on it? Are we going to feed on it? Are we going to move on that? Several months ago, there was a word out that tuna was going to be running right out the south coast of Cape Cod in South Africa. And it was going to be 50 kilometers off. And, but the waters were dangerous. And obviously, if you know anything about tuna, um, it's, 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 those are big fish. 
And so the warnings came out from the National Co- the Coast Guard and all of that. Uh, be careful. Because word was out that Jap- there was Japanese dealers that would pay up to $50,000 for a bluefin tuna. So greed was beginning to take off. So the, the little inexperienced boatsmen began to take over and begin to, to hook tunas. And there was a story of a 19-foot boot, a b- boat that was submerged and flipped because they hooked a tuna that turned the boat upside down. Another 28-foot boat also took in water because they had hooked a 275 kg tuna. And yet they were fed by their greed. They were fed by, and they were ill-equipped. They were not prepared. And I'm thinking, how many times do we feed that? Gospel of Mark tells us that from the mouth of Jesus Christ, he says these words. He says, for it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. It starts with the desire. It starts with the craving. It doesn't need to be many, just one. What is that craving? What is that desire that seems to make you vulnerable, that seems to be an open door for the enemy to come in? Could it be anger? Could it be bitterness, unforgiveness? When it feels so good to, to leash, to, 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 to punch back? Or, or could it be a gratification of the flesh uh, that, that makes you feel good? Uh, it could be um, um, pride that you feed that, boy, if you get that position, if you get that place, if you make that much money, you know, whatever it is, only one desire, not a multitude, just one, one craving that you act on, that you feed on. I think this is why Dietrich Bonhoeffer in his book, uh, Temptation, probably describes it much better than me. And if you remember, he was a German pastor in the Nazi Nazi concentration camp. But he wrote these words before this. And this is what he says about temptation. He says, with irresistible power, desire seizes mastery over the flesh. It makes no difference whether it is sexual desire or ambition or vanity or desire for revenge or love of fame or power or greed for money. Here, the joy in God is extinguished in us. At the moment, God is quite unreal to us. Satan doesn't fill our hearts with hatred of God, but hear this, forgetfulness of God. It is here that everything within me rises up against the word of God. God is not going to tempt you as a believer to hate God. Just simply forget him. That you're not mindful, that you're not cognizant, that, you, that you're not recognizing that God is right there and that this will deeply offend him and break his heart. This will cause him to be offended. And yet, again, when we're in this lust, when we're in this desire, when we're in this craving, when we're in this passion, the last thing we think about is God. So it begins with lust. Then, secondly, It gives birth to sin. Now, many mothers here, so you recognize these terms, right? It's conception and it's birth. There's no stillborn here. None at all. This one comes out alive. And there's actually a birth certificate. And the name of this one is called sin. Sin is a willful action that you've actually take action on that craving, on that desire. The temptation is not sin. The response to it is. That temptation hits you. Now, usually I would never ask you to do this, ever. But I think I, we need to make a point here. For, for one moment, I want you to think about somebody else's sin. Is that okay? So when you look at somebody else's sin, have you ever said this? When you look at somebody else's sin, no matter what it is, how many of you have ever said this? I would never do that. Have you ever said that? When you looked at somebody else's, whatever it might be, and you would immediately say, no way. I would never, never do that. How are they doing that? That is so gross or that is so defiant. Or, let me remind you that, that what may be another person's temptation may not be yours. But what may tempt you may not tempt the person next to you. Satan doesn't really care. He customizes these temptations. Just because we're tempted doesn't mean we've sinned. Whenever that temptation comes and it feeds those desires, then when we let that lust and that desire begin to to germinate inside of us and we feed it, then God says that lust now gives birth to sin. And it's inevitable. It is there. But then it concludes in death. It says when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. So that's the end result. Romans 6.23, we know this. 
We've learned this from Sunday school in Awanas. For the wages of sin is what? Death. Now, we in 21st evangelical Christians, we think we got this figured out, this death. The wages of sin is death. So we say this. When we die, our physical body cuts, shuts down, and that's the result of our sin, Pastor. That wages of sin is physical death. So when you do my funeral, that's the culmination of all my sin. Let me remind you that the wages of sin is death happens not just at your physical death. Every time you sin, a part of you dies. The wages of every sin is death. Let me give you an example. If you lie, if you speak lies to your spouse or to your family member, to your friends or to the body of Christ. Let me tell you what dies. It's called trust. The wages of sin is death. When there's been betrayal and adultery, let me tell you, your marriage begins to die. The wages of sin is death. When you have words of anger and bitterness and unforgiveness, that relationship begins to die. Wages of sin is death. Yes, it culminates in your physical death, but the death process begins way before we physically put you under. Wages of sin is death. It's inevitable. It's coming. One writer put it like this. The mother is that lust and that desire. The daughter is sin, and the granddaughter is death. That inevitable generational cycle that you cannot stop unless, harsh words, but hear this well, unless it's terminated by repentance. That path cannot be stopped, cannot be stopped unless it's terminated by repentance. So you see in verses 13 through 15, God does not tempt. Now we move to the second part, which to me is the positive side of who God is. God definitely does not tempt. He's holy, his character is like that, his activity is like that. Actually, the sin comes from us, our own desires. And it only takes one. And we feed it, and that lust gives birth to sin. Sin ends up in death. We see that. But on the positive side, God does not tempt, but God gives good gifts. What a remarkable difference, right? Instead of tempting you, enticing you, undermining your faith, undermining your relationship with others and, and with him, now he says, no, 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 no. I give good gifts. But before he, do that, he does that, in verse 16, he begins a transition in the section with a warning. So the warning is very simple. It says, do not be deceived, my beloved brother. Do not be misled. Do not be led astray. Do not be taken off course on this. I think for believers, our trouble is not so much unbelief. I think it's misbelief. I think we begin to believe that God does tempt us, that it is God's fault that we lost our job. It is God's fault that we lost a loved one. It is our God's fault that, that my aunt has cancer, or it's God's fault that, 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 that our finances are collapsing, so it's easy to blame God. Don't, under, don't misunderstand the goodness of God. Do not be deceived. Do not be caught in what I would call misbelief, incorrect belief. The origin of sin is not the devil made me do it. The origin of sin is not your wife or your husband or your son or your parents or your school or your job or your boss or your set of circumstances or the weather. It is you and me. We're the ones who must take responsibility. So we, we have to figure this out. We got to know who the enemy is. We got to know what battle we're fighting. He's got to be clear. There was a communist that came to a Christ under communist rule in Czechoslovakia. Then obviously that changed, and he made a remarkable statement. He says, it was very difficult to be a Christian under communism. But he said, actually now, it's even more difficult after communism fell. He says, at least under communism, you knew who the enemy was. Now it's not clear at all. And I'm looking at 21st century Singapore. Who is our enemy? Where do we stand? We get merging of culture and tradition and Christianity, and they all merge, and there's no distinction. The Christianity and Scripture takes priority over culture, over tradition. And sometimes we, we undermine the things of God, and we hear superstitions, and we hear this and this, and we have to understand, where's the enemy? The enemy is, is, is coming after us, and yet we have to stand on the truth of the Word of God. Do not be deceived. Do not misbelieve. God is, now, what he leads into the simple truth, 
The God gives good gifts. Look at verse 17. One of my favorite verses in all of James. It says, every good thing given and every perfect gift comes from where? Above. From the Father of lights, from, with whom there is no variation or shift in shadow. So let's see what God, God gives good gifts, right? Here it is. It's beautiful. So he talks about God is giving. He says he can't help it, right? This is his character. He, 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 he says he gives every good thing given. The word good means beneficial. It means useful. It means for your betterment, for your advancement, for your development, for, for your maturation. All of these things are, are useful or good or beneficial. And then he says every perfect. So he kind of doubles up. He says every good thing given and every perfect gift. Remember the word perfect back in verse 4. Perfect means complete. It means that there's nothing lacking. You know when God gives you peace, you do not have to top it up with the world's peace. Did you know that? When God gives you joy, you don't have to top it up with the world's joy. Oh, pastor, I just need to have fun according to the world. You don't need to top up. The problem may not be topping up God's joy. The problem is, do you even have God's joy? Because then if you really had it, you wouldn't need the world's joy. You wouldn't need the world's peace if God's given you his peace. God says every good thing and every perfect gift comes from above. In our, what I would call our horizontal perspective of hardship, maybe God is calling us to look up for him. That we need his gift. And I love it. It says coming from above. And that word coming is not like a trickle. It's not a one-off. It's an endless supply. It doesn't come just during Chinese New Year. It comes every day. It comes every moment. Good gifts are coming. His mercy, his compassion, his forgiveness, his peace, his love. All of those things are coming. Endless supply. Coming from above. The father of lights. Obviously, that's the stars, the sun, all of that. Father of all of creation. But light also reveals God's character, his brightness, his, his glory. And then I love the last part, with whom there is no shifting or variation or shift in shadow. That means God is unchanging. He never changes. He's always good. You know, here in Singapore, you get the sunrise and the sunset about the same time, right? Year round. Sometimes there's a little variation, but not much. It's always going to come. But you know what? It's changing. Every it's sun, sun up, sun down. Sun up, sun down. Daylight, dark. Daylight, dark. Always, always moving, right? See, it's there. Did you know right now the earth is rotating on its axis at 1,670 kilometers an hour? How many of you feel that breeze right now? <laughs> it's turning, right? How many? That's pretty fast. 1,670 kilometers an hour. It's rotating on its axis. Obviously, that doesn't move you. I can see that. <laughs> Let me try something else. Do you know that the earth is rotating around the earth at 108,000 kilometers per second? Can you even fathom that? So let me break it down a little bit simpler, okay? Here it goes. The, war, the, the earth is rotating around the earth at 30 kilometers a second. So that means it goes from east coast to west coast here in Singapore. 1.3 seconds. <laughs> How many of you feel the air blowing, blowing through your face right now? It, it's changing all the time. We even had the eclipse that the world experienced, where if you can see the, the photos, it seems like there's darkness, there's light, there's darkness, and there's all these shadows. And what God's word is saying, there is no shadow shifting with him. In John, 1 John 1, 5, it says, God is light. And in him, there is no darkness at all. God does not change. He does not tempt. He is holy. He is untemptable, and he will not lead you into evil. God's word says that. Doesn't change. Now, we, verse 17 opens up the creation. But verse 18, we close with this. To me, this is the perfect gift, the best gift. It says, in the exercise of his will, God brought us forth by the word of truth so that we might be a kind of first fruits among his creatures. So just like he spoke creation into being with his word, let there be light, and there was what? Light. Now with his word, he speaks spiritual life in us. Earlier we saw where lust gives birth to sin. Here his word gives spiritual birth to us. We are now his new creation. Next week we'll talk about the verse in verse 21. It says, in humility, receiving the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. When you've received the word of God, 
You have received life. You have received new birth. You have received hope. In striking contrast, the sin, that lust that you feed, that desire, that craving for anger, for resentment, for bitterness, for revenge, that craving for material possessions, for status, for, for money, for acquisitions, for power, for, for education, for accolades, for, for all of the prominence that, that is given to you. God is saying to you right now that you have a choice. Are you going to turn to that temptation that doesn't come from God? Or are you going to turn to the one who gives good gifts? And so today we have a choice. How can we terminate on this path of sin. How can we turn it around? And so let me offer you one final gift as we close this morning. It's called the gift of repentance. How many of you have gone sinless the last 168 hours? Just raise your hand. Anybody here has gone sinless the last... Jesus is obviously not in the crowd, right? (laughs) But all of us have sinned. No doubt about that. So how can we terminate this path? Repentance which is actually a gift from God. I want to introduce to you two passages, and I want to close with this, and my prayer is that this would actually be your prayer. The writer of 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14 says this, and and I want you just to quiet your hearts just for a moment and to allow the word of God to permeate inside of you. And I want you to hear maybe this call to repentance, maybe in a different kind of way. Maybe today God has struck a chord with you that, that you can't blame everybody else. You can't blame your parents, you can't blame your job, you can't blame your boss, you can't blame the conditions, you can't blame your, all of these things that we have this long list of everybody else but me. Maybe for the first time in a long time, you actually take responsibility for what you've done, your own sin. No more pointing at your parents, no more pointing at your spouse, no more pointing at other people and other circumstances. Let's take responsibility for what we've done. We fed, that lust has been given to us and desired, and we fed it. And our eyes have gotten away from Christ and been consumed with that anticipated pleasure. So the call for repentance is this. If my people who are called by my name, if you're a believer, you're going to take up the name of Christ. If you say I'm a Christian, you carry his name. If you say that I'm a part of the the, the family of God, you carry his name. If you have declared him as Lord, you carry his name. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves, which means we have to recognize who we are in the eyes of a holy God. We are sinners undone. We are in desperate need of God's forgiveness and his peace and his love and his compassion. And we cannot manufacture that ourselves. So we have to humble ourselves. We have to be brought low. And it says if we humble ourselves and seek his face, that means we desire his relationship with him more than anything else. Not to save face in front of our boss, in front of our family, in front of our kids, in front of our spouse, but to seek his face and turn from your wicked way, which means it requires action plans. It requires a decisive move from one way to the other. It requires an about face. It requires a going in another direction with a new mind. Then this is what God will do. And I want you to hear the promise. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then God promises this. Then I will hear from heaven. Can you imagine that? The infinite God hearing you. The infinite God knowing your heart. On on the face, on the on the front and on the face look that you give, it looks everything's okay. But inside you know you're in anguish, you know you're in pain. You know you've walked away from the things of God. You know that you've lost your passion. You're not as consistent as you used to be. Those things of God have has waned. You've wavered in unbelief. You've questioned God's goodness and his justice and his love and his mercy. And God says he will hear. His acoustics will go to the depth of your soul. He's heard all of your excuses. He's heard all of your gripes. He's heard all of your blame. And yet he will hear your heart now. Not only will he hear your heart, he will see your tears. He will see your pain. He will hear you. Then God says he will forgive. I I, I can't oversell this. 
God will actually cleanse my sin. He'll take that guilt. He'll take that thing that separated me from him. And he'll make me new. He'll, he'll take that load and carry it away. He'll wash me. He'll make me pure again. And then that last promise that says he will heal your land. That land starts with your heart. Then it will go to your marriage. It will go to your home. Then it will go to your land. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. We're about to go into a season of prayer. And I think, honestly, there have been seasons in my life when I've sinned when I could not actually find words to ask God for help. I feel so contaminated, so infected, so tainted, so filthy in the eyes of a holy God. I feel like it was my rebellion, my, my pride, my, my arrogance, my disobedience, whatever it might be. God, God says, I, I can't even, how do you approach a holy God, right? I, I don't even have the words to articulate. To, I just know I'm bad. I know I'm way away from God. I know my heart has grown cold. And so I can't find the words. And God knows this. This is why he puts certain scriptures in to help us articulate words that we on our own could not. And so what I'm going to close today with is a simple prayer of confession from David. I think it's there because he knows we need help when it comes to confessing of our sins. That sometimes we just don't have the words in ourselves. But I'm going to pray that this prayer would actually become my prayer and would become your prayer. And I don't ask you to do this very often, so I'm, it's a little unusual, but I think today's appropriate. I'm going to actually, actually ask you to close your eyes and bow your heads. And I know God doesn't need that, but I think for us to block out, remember, we're so used to blaming everybody else. So, look at, so we're used to looking at someone else. I think today is our time to turn inward between us and God. And so I'm going to walk you through this prayer of Psalm 51. And as I utter these words from God's word. My prayer is that your heart would gravitate toward these words and let them be your own. Let's pray. Be gracious to me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the greatness of thy compassion, Blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgression is my sin is ever before me. Against you and you alone I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight. And you are justified when you speak and you're blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin. My mother did conceive me. Behold, you do desire truth in the innermost being, in the hidden part. You will make me know wisdom. Purify me with hyssop. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sin and blot out my iniquities. Create, 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 create in me a new heart. Create in me a new heart, oh God. And renew a right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore, 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 restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a will and spirit. Then I will be able to teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken contrite heart, oh God, you will not despise Father, let that be our prayer today. Cleanse, purify, restore, make new. Forgive, pardon, 
Later on in James, it will say, quite shocking words, by the way. It says, confess your sins one to another. Pray for one another so that you may be healed. There's no doubt in my mind that whenever you confess your, your sins, God will hear. He will forgive, no doubt. But I think he also knows us. I think sometimes we just don't simply believe it sometimes. We think we're too dirty, we think we're too tainted, we think we're too hard, we think we're too cold, we don't, we're not worthy. I think God sometimes sends help to us. And he says in James at the end, confess your sins one to another. Why would he ask us to do that? I'm not saying for us to have a, a parade of people lined up confessing our sins to the whole congregation, but I am telling you, the power, the power the effectiveness, the healing, and the hope, the health, when you open up your heart to one other person, that person isn't God. I understand that. But that person is a tangible expression. You can see a face. Sometimes when you're so far removed from God, God is so invisible. You can't see him. But when you confess your sins to someone else, then that person has a one responsibility and one responsibility only, and it's not to condemn you. It is to pray for you. And there's three parties involved in this process. You confess, that person prays, God heals, God saves, God restores. I don't know how that works completely except that it does. So I'm going to challenge you if you are carrying a sin in your heart, yes, confess to God, no doubt. But it might be helpful too to let that sin, that burden, be brought with someone else. Not to condemn you, not to judge you, not to carry it against you in the future, but for them simply to pray for you. And then God says that dynamic of you confessing in their prayer, God seems to accelerate the process of bringing healing and hope to you. So as we close today, I'm going to close with this simple challenge. We're going to just have a minute or two just to, to respond. And if you want somebody to pray over you, maybe that person sitting next to you. Maybe you'd like for one of us to pray with you. We would be honored to do that. But I think we're at a critical junction on our spiritual journey at IBC. I don't think we're here in James by accident. I think he's letting you know that he gives good gifts. He's giving you the gift of repentance. He's giving you this opportunity to respond. Even though you've been tempted, even though you may have fallen, God has given you a hope today. So let's, as, as we prepare our hearts, let's respond to God's word. Father, over the next few moments, Father, if we simply need to confess to you, let that be clearly known. But Father, if we need to confess to someone else just to help us in our spiritual journey, Father, I pray that that would be clear as well. Father, move on our hearts now. In Jesus' name. I'm going to ask that you stand initially. Again, this section will be just a moment or two. not going to be long. But if you would like someone to pray with you, if you just like to grab the person next to you and say, hey, would you pray with me? I'm having trouble in this area of anger. I'm having trouble with worry. Let's stand now as we respond to God's word. Again, this section won't take long, but I wanted you to have a chance to respond to God's word today. <laughs>